medication and, and sort of talking therapies. Um, and people kept saying, you know what, I, you know, mountaineering is just such a part of my life that it's crucial to my ongoing recovery. Or, you know, when I knit, it feels like such a cathartic experience and it's really helping my depression. We kept hearing these stories, you know. And also for ourselves, you know, Olivia and I, we have both have activities that help our mental illness and our depression immeasurably. So for me, it's kind of cycling and exercise, but also reading and writing, you know, it's, it's a huge tools of my, my ongoing recovery. And for Olivia, it's walking and, and kind of mountain climbing. And, you know, we just kept having conversations about how important these things were, you know, and actually how, you know, they, they, these aren't things that are, should be replacing anything. They don't, it's not like, as I say in the introduction to the book, it's not like you need to go paragliding and suddenly, you know, all your mental illness will disappear. You know, we're, we're certainly not, we're not saying that, but we both knew and we both kept hearing how activities and hobbies were crucial to people managing depression. Um, and, and we, yeah, and then we wanted to collect those stories and hoping to kind of inspire people to continue what they're doing, their hobbies, but you know, maybe also try other ones, you know, uh, try other stuff that might, that might help. Um, so yeah, that was the kind of inspiration for the book. And we've got these wonderful accounts from people all over the world about their different hobbies and activities and how they've helped. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, when you say managing depression, because obviously what you just said in terms of, you know, this, this miracle cure, um, <laughs> you know, I suppose some people can maybe dismiss hobbies because they think, well, it's, it's hardly going to, you know, Cure yeah. everything. But when you say about managing depression, can you speak to that a little bit more? And um, you know, from even from your experience. Yeah. So, so, so for me, when I when my depression was, for, I mean, I've lived with depression since a child, but it got it got particularly dreadful about about ten years ago, and and I wasn't able to read. So, um, you know, reading was such a huge part of my life, um, and suddenly I couldn't read a thing. But what I could do was write. And that was such a massive outlet for me. It was just huge because it was, it was about, I couldn't take things in because my brain was spending so much time managing the depression, but actually stuff needed, needed to get out, to get regurgitated and, and sort of um, have, have, a, and have an outlet basically. So I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote terrible stuff. I mean, truly, truly terrible plays that should never be put on. But you know, <laughs> it, did, it did, really didn't matter. You know, it really didn't matter because A, it was an outlet for what I was feeling and experiencing, but it was also something that I could do. And there were so many things that I couldn't do that having a thing that I could do was so crucial to my self-esteem and, and that sense of hope that I could you know, move forward with my recovery. So it's like, oh, well, I can't, I can't read, I can't watch television, I can't listen to music, but actually I can write, I can do that. And I'm gonna hang on to that and I'm gonna do it. And I can cycle. So I cycled a lot every day. And hanging on to those things that I could do helped me in that real crisis point of my depression but also now continue to help me, you know, um, day to day, I do those things. And now, thankfully, I'm able to, I'm able to read too, so I can kind of add that in. But it's, it's a sense of achievement. It's a sense of having hope in your life. It's a sense that depression hasn't taken everything away because that's what it feels like. It feels like depression has taken everything away, including your sense of self. So hanging on to those things that you can do and that are help are absolutely absolutely crucial and you say this in the, in the introduction as well I wondered if, if you wanted to speak to the introduction a little bit or, or, or read from it at all yeah yeah let me let me read a little bit um so here we go so uh, it's always been my firm view that cuddling baby pandas uh should be on prescription in fact so should annual three-month holidays to Antigua uh free chocolate fountains and weekly play sessions with exuberant six-week-old Labrador puppies. After the success of the recovery letters, we wanted to write a follow-up that would continue to help all of us on this wavy, strange, dizzying path of recovery. We wanted to hear more stories from people like me and you who live alongside depression and other mental illnesses. 
we kept hearing how people had found things in their life that made them feel better, things that made their illness more bearable and gave them meaning, relief and hope, and dare we say the word, happiness. I wouldn't be alive without climbing, we kept hearing. Or it might sound odd, but I could honestly say knitting has helped me more than anything else. The more we heard, the less odd it seemed. With the long wait for talking therapies and the mixed results of antidepressants, we have to find things that work alongside of, or instead of, the medical options. When mental illness strikes, we need tools at our side, and I'm not talking a large monkey wrench here. We have to find activities in our life that distract, heal, exercise, and calm. And I think that's that's crucial, you know. Um, having things that, that, that soothe you and comfort you um, when depression is attacking you, you know, it, it is like, it's like a physical, feels like a physical form of attack and trying to find the thing that works for you is really important. Um, but also not to, not to judge it. So I tried some things that, you know, really, really didn't, didn't work. Um, but, the, but I found the things that did. You know, I found the things that did and you sort of have to keep at it a bit, you know. So I made a terrible attempt at tapestry, which um, my husband looked at and went, oh, that's that's lovely. And um, it quickly went to the bin. But that's OK, <laughs> because I can do other stuff, you know, okay. um, and it's finding the other stuff that helps. Um, yeah. And that's and that's the crucial thing. And sometimes there's, you know, there's value in just trying something, as you say, not judging it, not thinking I'm, I'm forever more going to be a knitter for, for a period. I remember I, I tried knitting and actually for that period, it really helped. I don't, don't knit now, but I might knit in the future, but it really helped at the time. Just as you say, being able to put one stitch on after another, create a row, it sort of marked progress when I felt like I was languishing. Yeah. So that's, I think that's, um, yeah, exactly what you said. Absolutely. Um, Thank you for that. And I wonder if we're able to pass over to Orna to read her um, excerpt uh, from the book, her piece about art. Is, is that okay, Orna? Would you feel up to that? Oh, thanks, Carolyn. Um, okay, so art. There is one night in your room when you think, I can't do this, and you find yourself searching feverishly for a belt. You might just pass out very slowly, you think but you can't find a belt, so you go to bed instead. And in the morning you cry, but you draw something. Well, you think in a kind of simple literality, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I was dead. Depression brings with it a new kind of normalcy. Days are spent in a kind of chronic aloneness that no amount of smiling from strangers can pierce. You put on a cute outfit and you do your hair and you walk the dog and you wander the streets alone pretending to be just as alive as anyone else, sometimes sitting in a bus stop, overwhelmed by all the crushing, violent nothing inhabiting your days. You listen to music, the same songs on repeat, and you're so ashamed of yourself. You ask the air around you, dense and filled with the breath and sweat of the productive, the talented, the employed, leaving wraith-like impressions as they pass you by. What happened to me? Where did I go? So you go home again, but you learn to draw and you're good at it. You hate admitting you're good at anything. This isn't something you often feel, but say it, you are good at it. You follow YouTube tutorials and you mimic the sketches of Instagrammers you like and you learn to draw. And yes, you realize you're good at it. No one and nothing can take that feeling away. You steadily shrink in the mirror but when you draw, it's not compulsion that bends you, but desire. You feel things you haven't felt in what seems like years. Pride, a sense of achievement, of accomplishment, delight in combining paint and ether to effect a small change in this world, bright and flat and heartening. You experiment with new and different tools. And when things are bad, it's art that allows you the space to be the person you have become. It's someone you neither like nor recognize, quiet and focused and lonely, but simply are now. Art quietens your fears and lets you be yourself without judgment. You're not crazy or fat or oversensitive or stupid. You're simple when you draw. Two hands, black pens, white paper. 
you're at peace. I'm in pain, you tell your heart. I know it whispers low and dark in your chest, but you like drawing, it soothes. You're not in pain in this moment. Art therapy is a conduit for emotion, a way for those ill-equipped with words to represent their experience on a page. That's not your intention, but you're as elementary as you are complex, you're human, and your pictures are often studies of pain. They're of monsters escaping like vapor from the chest of a woman, of dark-eyed women drowning, of women broken and cut into segments like oranges, of women lying supine, reaching and gazing backwards with a pleading look, of a black figure in silhouette, calmly swinging beneath the waves, entangled in the tendrils of a massive stinging jellyfish. Art saves you on a cold night in January. You have escaped all the badness, you think, in this fresh start, and you are at the kitchen table in your own country with the cool hardwood of your mother's dining chair supporting your back like a second spine. I'll do something with this, you think. So you enter a competition and you set up a little shop and you ring other illustrators for advice and you write an article about art therapy where your interviewees tell you the point of art therapy is not to be good, but to recover. It doesn't matter if it looks like a horse, they say. What matters is that the creator knows it is a horse. When did being good become more important than the process, you wonder. So you stop. You wake up one morning and you draw nothing. You don't draw for a whole month and that month becomes two. You listen to the soft animal of your body when it begs you to be alone and quiet. It has taken you over six months, but one day you stay in bed all day and do nothing. No drawing, no talking, no TV, and you don't judge yourself for it. But the paper is there. And when you are packing for a holiday with a friend, you think about the way you would like to spend your free time and you realize that you miss it keenly. In the kitchen, on the first night of your holiday on a Grecian party island, you forego bright lights, cheesy come-ons and spilled drinks, and you and your friend paint quietly. You delight in his enjoyment and pride, and you realise that you're enjoying the smooth movements of the brush so much. There is pain there too. There is always the same nugget of pain there. It will always be there, you realise. You grieve for the version of you, that, once, that would once have much preferred the call of a dance floor, the drunken blather of a chat with a stranger, the excitement of the new and loud and garish. But that pain lives in you now beside more grace and compassion and love. It is as much a part of you as your heart or your hands. With smooth, with smooth flowing movements, you acknowledge it, but stop fighting and let it pass you by. You forgive yourself, and let go of where you might be or what you should be. You think of your first rudimentary pieces and how different they were to what you're producing now, but realize that every piece was valid. Every time you drew, you knew it was a horse. Like the discarded sheets around you, you are a work in progress, always learning, heart and hands. Thank you very much. Um, some nice comments in the chat as well. It is a really, really moving piece. And there's so much in there to pick up on. Um, you know, so many lines that really struck me in terms of the loss of self that accompanies depression and a, or a period of mental illness. Um, and, you know, you've, you've got these lines that say, where did I go? Um, you know, and, and it, it's about that kind of refinding the self in a but in a different form or, or recreating. Is that kind of what you felt that you were doing with, with your art, that you were kind of recreating a, a new normal, if you like, or finding a way back to recognizing who you were? Yeah, absolutely. Um, at the time, I, I had always considered myself, and I think it was it formed a large part of my identity, was that I thought of myself as a writer. And uh, when the period that I'm writing about in 2018, I uh, had stopped writing um, and I just, my self-esteem was completely in the toilet. And it was a kind of a combination of not working, not writing, this just massive depression that I was in. And I really did feel like I had completely lost what comprised me. 
um, which is a to just like a completely unmoored feeling. You start to kind of float around in the world, this kind of derealization. Um, so when I started drawing, it was a, a surprise to me that I could draw. Um, and I only took it up because I actually happened to chance it upon some paints that somebody had left behind. And that's kind of how I got into drawing and painting. And it was, it was like accessing a part of myself that I hadn't known was there. And it gave me something that was entirely mine, something that I could cherish and nurture in a, you know, a private way. And it really gave me a lot of hope as well, which was something that was just completely devoid from my life at that point. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it was like, I would say it was like kind of re regrowth or, or um, finding confidence again, but also finding a new part of myself. And that was a massive surprise in the kind of the depths of that depression. So it was, it was something that really helped pull me out of it as well and gave me that sense of, uh, of self again. Yeah. Yeah. I love that word regrowth as well. I think we, we tend to use, there, there's a lot of terminology around mental ill health that is, I don't know, it becomes numb. The more it's used, it, it seems to lose its meaning. And so yeah. these kind of new ways of thinking about, I, I guess, strategies for managing and finding recovery and, and that idea of regrowth, as you say, I think is so potent. I remember Marion Keyes talking about how when she went through a really severe a uh, crisis, a, a breakdown, and she turned to baking. Um, I, I think she published a book actually, but she was really, again, there's that sense of surprise because you find a talent, a skill, and even a part of yourself that, that perhaps, you know, you'd never identified before. Has that yeah. stayed with you then, the, the, the sort of, this hobby? Yeah, after I, uh, after I took up drawing and um, some friends were kind of suggesting like oh you should make t-shirts or you should do x y and z so I uh, kind of ran with it I entered an entrepreneurship competition in Ireland um, and I did pretty okay in that and I decided right I'm going to make something of this so at the start of last or at the start of the last academic year last September I actually started graphic design so now I'm making, yeah, I'm going to make uh, image making, art making, graphic artifact making my career, hopefully. Um, and yeah, so it's really opened up just a whole new uh, kind of chapter of my life even. Um, so yeah, I'm really, I'm very thankful. It's immense. I mean, that that is such an inspirational story. I think that needs to be heard by so many people, you know, struggling. Mm -hmm. I think the last thing you think when you're going through a period that you've described the last thing you're thinking is that in two, three years or whatever years time, I'm going to be venturing off in some really brilliant new path, you know, so that's really great to hear. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Orna, um, for reading that, uh, that excerpt. I wonder, Georgina, might have turned to you um, and invite you to read your chapter about singing from the book. Yeah, thanks so much. Oh, singing. I sing everywhere, on my bike, at work, and obviously in the shower. But the summer before my 27th birthday, I wasn't singing in the shower. I was crying while thinking of ways to kill myself. For six months, my optimistic, life-loving life -loving soul was hijacked by a force that took its place in the driving seat of my every thought, depression. Goodness, joy and fun existed in a different world on the other side of a locked door. Depression has a cunning way of showing you all the good, all the bad in the world, hiding all the good, and then portraying this biased view as the truth. I couldn't understand how people around me were so full of joy. I decided they must all be kidding themselves. I dragged myself through the unbearably long days pasting on the closest thing to a smile I could remember. I couldn't even remember the person I'd been for 27 years, and I came to an undeniable conclusion. I was just shit. I became an emotional black hole. I didn't and couldn't care about anything. I lost all my self-confidence because I couldn't even hold a conversation. I believed that I didn't deserve to be loved. I tried various tactics to wrench my soul from depression's grasp, 
including blue tacking life affirming messages all over my wall. A few months later, this had ripped the paint off the wall, but it didn't touch depression. But there was one activity with a voice loud enough to challenge depression's onslaught of insults, singing at choir. Like a memory stirred, singing reminded me of the happier person I'd once been, and it was the closest I felt to being her. Choir opened a crack in the doorway into that elusive world of happiness I couldn't otherwise reach. It allowed the light from that forgotten place to stream in, and I basked in its heavenly glow. Choir gave me a foothold on recovery. Feeling just not awful was a miracle in itself, which offered a glimmer of hope that I was heading towards the dizzy heights of okay. Singing was something, the only thing, that I could consistently enjoy. At the time, it felt like magic, but I now see that the healing power of group singing is made of many elements. However, there is one constant which runs through every cause of depression like an underlying baseline, the absence of human connection. In the daily grind of our lives, where we'd prefer an unexpected item in the bagging area to interacting with a human till operator, and where we silently stand shoulder to armpit inside sweaty boxes that transport us across hostile cities, our sense of connection is as non-existent as the conversation with the human being next to us. When was the last time you sang in a group? And why did you do it? Whether it's at a football match or a wedding, adding our voice to the singing of a group connects us to the people around us throwing out melodic lifelines that entwine us at our deepest level. In the most important ceremonies of our lives, we sing together, like indigenous tribes that live according to the rituals of their ancestors, we mark life's milestones by uniting our voices in song. In times of intense emotion or mourning, when we are pulled deep into our humanness and experience the rawness at our core, we sing together. Human connection is the foundation of our survival. At its heart, quiet is teamwork, without the rafts and bad coffee, but often with cake. It's a contribution to something greater. And if you want to know what it feels like to be in a room where your voice meets others in powerful harmony that makes the air sick with joy, making your hairs stand on end and your face burst into a smile, then you'll have to be there, part of it. To sing in a group is to build a kingdom with voices. It is to create, and it is to fill your mind with musical notes and dynamics and rhythm and lyrics so that depression is squeezed the hell out. To sing in a community is also to build lifelong friendships. Choir is people coming together to pursue a mutual passion, and it is also, literally every week, hilarious. And laughter is one of the most powerful antidotes to depression's venom. We laugh during the warm-up games that we love to pretend we hate, at geeky musical theatre in-jokes, and at even more geeky niche musical theatre references that you feel like a god if you actually get. There is innuendo all over the shop, and every time there's a Rod and Chimney reference in Mary Poppins, and stomach shaking, trying not to laughter when you realize you have absolutely no idea what you're supposed to be singing and catch someone's eye across the room. The camaraderie of, oh God, we still don't know it, 10 minutes before the final rehearsal, then huddling for a frantic run through in the foyer. Immense pride when your friend sings solo for the first time. I've kept coming to choir when house moves have meant it's taken almost two hours to get there. I've stayed because those bonds, which have carried me when I've been down and lift me higher when I'm level, are stronger than depression. They pull me into the heart of something that is the backbone of our species survival, community. When you're depressed, self-destructive tendencies like ignoring your phone will disconnect you even more from friends and family. When my confidence and self-esteem were at rock bottom, fun events just left me feeling worse. 
because they inevitably involved a situation that exposed my useless social skills. It became the sensible option to stop turning up. Choir kept me tethered to other humans and the world. Depression turned me against myself. I would seek out flaws in everything I did, compare myself with others, and constantly, constantly remind myself that I was crap at everything. And anxiety, depression's BFF, robbed me of the minimum focus I needed to do my job. At work, I felt utterly useless. But at choir, I was forced to acknowledge that I wasn't useless at singing. I was actually quite good at it. And not only that, I was, we were, making progress week on week, completing more of a song, remembering more of the words, becoming more confident with the harmony. Progress by its nature leads to confidence because it's the hard evidence of your ability that even depression can't deny. My choir is one of the most cherished things in my life. Most choirs are non-audition and a quick browse of their website will give you an idea of the vibe. If you're even mildly curious, contact some local choirs and ask if you can go along for a trial session. It's what I did 10 years and 10,000 giggles ago. Choir has given me a sense of achievement that nothing else could. The power of getting that tricky part right and nailing the verse and chorus in spine tingling harmony. Pride is transformative and a rare gift when depression is doing everything in its power to steal it. Choir can bring you comfort that even in your most wretched projection of the future, you will always have singing and choir and friends to sing with. Depression bullied me into being quiet and meek because I didn't want to be seen for the hideous person I believed I was. Singing gives me a chance to raise my voice. To anyone going through depression now, you will smile and laugh and love life again. And it might just be that group singing is the foothold you need to get yourself back. Thank you. I want to applaud you. <laughs> that was so beautiful. <laughs> and um, yeah, again, like Orna, really, really inspiring. You, I was sitting making mental notes. I'm going to go and Google the <laughs> choir near me. Oh, fantastic. Because <laughs> yeah. no, I, and there was, there was three words there that I really, uh, or maybe four, um, you know, that I really felt, you know, when you, when you talked about connection, I thought, yes, that is so, so important. One of the first things and, and conversely, one of the strongest things you feel, I suppose, when you're going through a really terrible time mentally is a lack of connection with yourself and with other people. Mm -hmm. And it is a sort of, it's a, you know, a kind of loneliness, isn't it? That sure. you, you're reachable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so to create that sort of new connection, I think is, is so important and, and you mentioned community as well which you know really when, when you think of what we've all gone through over the past year that lack of community um has just been sort of devastating so yeah you know you can see then the impact of that that loss of community um really does impact people uh negatively but conversely as you find just being among people again um and being seen somehow right even in a small kind of way or a small brief way um, is, is crucial, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think also creating, you know, I think singing together and, and or creating art as, as Orna discussed um, mm -hmm. is, you know, again, even in a very small way is, is, um, is healing and can just lift you just enough to feel that you've, you know, you've, you're above the, the surface of the water. Yeah. Um, thank you so much to both of you for reading those really beautiful chapters. Um, and I want to go back and, and reread them because there's so much truth and, and beauty in, in both of them and, and in the whole book. Um, I wonder if, if we could maybe invite the audience. I mean, would, would the audience feel comfortable at all in um, sharing any hobbies or interests that you use to aid your mental health? Um, what works for you and perhaps you know the panel can can talk about these um i mean julie you've posted here that you're in two choirs a small church choir and a ladies choir of 60 wow 
we have virtual rehearsals for the latter, but it isn't the same as being in the same room together as we can't hear each other due to different internet speeds. It feels so powerful when singing with others. I mean, I, I hear that. I, I think that's that's lovely, Julie, that, that that's, you know, you're in a choir as well. Luckily, we can do a lot of things, you know, online, but you're right. Sometimes it's just not the same and it needs to be in the same space. And um, we've got Katie Bennett Davies gardening. Um, yeah. Do any of you garden? I'm just talking to the panel now. Yeah, I, I, I garden. Yeah. I mean, again, not well. But um, so I, <laughs> Me neither. I, I only I only grow stuff that that slugs and snails won't eat. So, um, but I, I, when I was first really ill with depression, I volunteered in a community allotment, um, and that was my kind of one kind of meaningful bit of activity that I did a week. And yeah, and and again, I you know I wasn't very good. You know, I planted like thousands of carrot seeds in one spot. And, and um, strangely yeah. enough, they didn't all grow. But, you know, but what I was really good at was digging up bindweed, you know, and just kind of getting at it, you know, and there's, there's something for me about garden, and I have, I have a kind of small garden, but, but there's something for me about um, when you plant something, there's a, there's a degree of hope attached to that, you know. Yeah. Um, so when I plant bulbs in November, there's a kind of, there's a kind of faith and hope. That they that they'll come up, you know, in in, in the spring. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's that kind of investment yeah. in your future, which which depression is trying to take away. Um, but it but it's also kind of it's it's a kind of cleansing for me. So when I get a weed and I dig it up, or or when I see that something is in flower, then um, it's an amazing feeling. And there's there's a beautiful um, piece in the book about gardening, um, which is which is which is really moving. So yeah, gardening is is definitely one that helps helps me a lot. Yeah, I, I can relate to that too. I remember um, when lockdown started last year, as well as starting a literary festival, I bought a, a <clears throat> just a cheap plastic greenhouse. Um, I think it was from Aldi. And uh, yeah, we just used like old milk, I cut milk cartons and in, in to your yogurt pots or whatever and just put some seeds in. And it was it was surprising how cathartic it was to just see, see them start to grow. And of course they, they sprouted, it was, you know, once they started, they, they were so resilient, despite my lack of abilities with gardening. Um, it was, but it's lovely to see. And it makes me think of something that you said, Georgina, um, it's a contribution to something greater. And I, I think that whether it's choir or art or putting some little tiny seeds in a, in a yogurt pot, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a contribution. Yeah. And that's that small little effort still is a contribution to something greater. Um, and we've got some really great uh, just hobbies coming in from the audience. Donna Smith has said, writing works for me, me too. Yep, that's that's the thing that, <clears throat> excuse me, for me has always been my kind of go-to thing. Perhaps we all have a sort of, you know, inclination one way or the other. Knitting hasn't stuck with me, but I did enjoy it, but it's not my kind of thing. Um, but writing has, has been the thing that stuck. <clears throat> Nina has said, I had to start a diary, clinical depression. It started as just red line or green line, then words, then letters, then journaling, and wow. then it brought me back to writing. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and writing for me came as a result of depression. So my, in about 2014, I had like really bad depression for about six months, which is the period I refer to in the book, um, where I thought I couldn't say any of it. I didn't have the words to express what I was feeling, I, I, I couldn't share it, I couldn't tell people, I didn't even realise I was depressed for a long time. Um, and it was only after I kind of came out the other side of it and then I started sort of starting to write about it mostly because I wanted to sort of explain to friends and family where I'd been for the six months previously because I'd felt like I'd been completely absent and like Orna mentioned, like I wasn't me, I wasn't really there and I felt that I needed to sort of explain it but it took me 10,000 words to <laughs> to explain um, because I really sort of distilled sort of the elements of what depression is um, because it was sort of a discovery for me um, so I wasn't a writer before I was depressed and this the piece I first wrote was you know it was genuinely a sort of explanation to friends and family um, that got 
shared many times and is now had about sort of 90,000 hits but that was that was what started my writing and if I hadn't been depressed I never would have found writing it was just you know as James said as well he could write although he couldn't sort of read because there was so much to get out and it was sort of I think those six months of having everything trapped in and then the kind of the result was that it all came out through writing on a page and that for me is something hugely positive that I now can kind of call myself a writer so it's yeah, it's interesting how things work. <laughs> that's that's massive. You know, I, I think that's that's just huge. And I love what you say about, you know, trying to communicate to your friends and family because there is that aspect of the loss of self as well that other people can see. Mm. And they're sort of questioning, but sometimes you have no idea what's going on at all. It's it's very hard to communicate. Yeah, if I could just add as well, I think, uh, and part of my piece as well was just stopping at one point and I think you, what you were saying there's a direction in which you're naturally inclined like knitting is not necessarily your thing but something else is and I think it's good uh, or rather the hobby is beneficial when you're not forcing it or you're not using it as a marker of your own esteem or worth it's more about the the practice of it and the enjoyment of it and finding peace and happiness in it rather than turning it into another kind of metric of your own value or mm -hmm. progress or or if, if if you feel like it's good obviously that's a great thing but yeah just to move the focus away from how am I achieving something to am I enjoying this am I fully present am I living do I feel alive kind of thing yeah yeah I think, that, I think, I think that, that's, that's so important you know that's it's just crucial that bit you know because you know, with depression, we're getting such a hard time. We're getting such a hard time from, from the illness, you know, that that if we start to give ourselves a hard time about not being able to do the hobby that we're trying to do, then it just compounds and, you know, co coerces with the illness to make ourselves feel even worse than we already are, you know. Um, so, you know, anything that you that you get enjoyment from, like Orna saying, and and any kind of small, small achievement, you know, so... I recently, um, I kept trying to grow an avocado plant, I kept trying to grow this avocado plant. I couldn't do it. And, and, and finally, I found this fantastic blog around, you know, how to actually do it properly. And I worked out why I wasn't, the avocado plant wasn't growing. And now I have this massive <laughs> kind of, uh, avocado plant. And the sheer kind of pleasure I get from looking at this avocado plant and going, Oh, I finally, I mean, I've been trying to do this for years, years and years and years, and finally managed to grow this avocado plant is is massive, is is absolutely massive. And and it's something that I something that's tangible that I can I can look at and go, I managed to do that. I actually managed to grow the freaking avocado plant, you know. So we have these markers, like I want to saying, that that you can look back on. And and I'm sure you find that with your writing at Carolyn as well, that you know. I can look back at books and go, I managed, I managed to write a book, you know, or I managed, you know, never. whatever it might be. That knows. I think, I think it might, I never do that. I just, I never do that. I never, you know? I'm always, no, I don't, but I would look at an avocado plant. I, I definitely would look at that with a sense of achievement. <laughs> I'm going to go and Google that after this. I have a lemon tree that is not doing so well. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm obviously needing to Google. So yeah, no, but you're right. Those, those, I was really struck by what Nina Lewis posted in, in the chat just here about starting a, a diary with a red, starting with a red line or green line. And sometimes it is about being super, super, super small and not because yeah. I don't know about you guys, but something that um, another positive outcome that I had my uh, mental crash, whatever term um, in 2000, it was the beginning of 2014, Christmas of 2013 for about a year. And yeah, just um, it, it taught me to appreciate my limits and to really respect my limits. I, I just hadn't, you know, and I think burnout and, you know, not, not paying attention to your reserves uh, leads, can lead anyone, anyone to this. And so, yeah, being able to appreciate your limits and just start really, really small. I think that's so powerful and so important to remember. I think it is. I know. So I think Emily had, and the chat was was writing about running, and um, yeah. I, I think there's certainly when I 
so now I was ill and I so I used to go or I still I, I go to the gym now but but I, I was you know the thought of going to gym when I was really depressed and and literally going nowhere just going around on a treadmill was was just really awful but actually when I got on my bike and kind of was able to kind of move so all these kind of metaphors are, are just really strong with 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 activities and hobbies you know so yeah. the kind of the kind of sense of movement um that I felt from cycling and I don't maybe, I don't know whether Emily feels like that as well but she talks about the fresh air the rhythm and the distraction you know mm -hmm. which is kind of really important um and I so I was so I would do a cycle a day so I would cycle I live by the sea so I cycled along the coast and I cycled back again and that was the one thing that I would I would do once a day um but that feeling of oh I am moving when yeah. in my brain it felt like nothing was moving and that it was yeah. sludge and mud and pain um was really really important you know it's like well my body can move and if I you know that's something that can keep moving and um and I can get you know I did exactly the same journey um back and forth along along the sea for for a year um and that and that was immeasurable you know it was a marker of time it was a marker of being able to do something um and other things that I that I couldn't do you know it was um these things are are so important at the time of when our mental illness or mental health is in crisis and ongoing, you know, yeah. um, they really are. We have a little comment from um, Tilly. I'm struggling currently. I used to work in the Welcome Collection until I was signed off from working there two years ago. I'm also a freelance performance and visual artist, but I've not been able to do much of that within the last two years either. So yeah. um, I wonder if there's any kind of, I don't know, advice or, you know, sometimes it's just about, because something that really struck me when I went through a mental, my own mental patch was how you forget your brain is so taken up with just trying to cook to just get through that you forget the strategies. It's, it's so, yeah. yeah. Sometimes you do just have that period where I suppose you just feel like you can't. And that's what Tilly said. I used to go to choirs, love singing, drawing, can't do anything. I made a smallness. I, th I think it's really important to to know that that has happened to all of us yeah. you know it, that that has happened that is part of depression that it will take away the things that you need so it will take away all your coping mechanisms so realize that that's the illness and not you that's not a failure on your behalf that's what the illness does it will take away so the thing that I wanted to do desperately when I was ill was to read because it was that was my comfort and I, and I couldn't do it. And the loss was immeasurable. And I'm sure you're feeling that loss as well, Tilly. Um, I would say, try something different, try anything, try something different um, and experiment with, with anything. So, you know, it could be, you know, doing rag, making a rug. It could be, it could be, yeah, just drawing really simple things. It could be, you know, using, you know, art on the computer, you know, that's really easy to access. Um, it could be little bits of writing. It could be, you know, going out and walking, anything, anything small, anything that gives you a sense of a small sense of meanings. I don't I think don't expect it, it to be a kind of a big revelation. Suddenly I can, you know, decoupaging my chest of drawers is going to be the answer. You know, try something really, really small, you know, really tiny. And and if you get that just that little spark of enjoyment or from it, then that's then that's enough. You know that that really is enough. Um, if I could uh, just add to that as well, um, yeah. something that I learned in in therapy, a big part of depression obviously is a lack of motivation, and um, they, there's a thing called the five minute rule for procrastination, where if you really really don't feel like doing something, just force yourself and just say, right, I'm just going to do this for five minutes. And most people find that if they start and they get five minutes done that they keep going and um, it's not that hard to do it once you're doing it it is the initial kind of push that feels difficult but if you can just say to yourself it's just five minutes I'm only committing to five minutes and I'm going to do it invariably we lose track of time and we keep going yeah. and I often find and um, I have pretty bad generalized anxiety and a lot of the time I'll be like oh I don't want to meet someone or I'll get that kind of trembly feeling and I just think you know what I'm just going to do it and 
and I do and I just push myself to do the thing and every single time I'm like well that was not nearly as bad as I had anticipated it being and I think that really applies to almost anything if you just give yourself that initial push even when it feels like impossible your body will keep going once you have a little bit of momentum and um, so yeah I'd say start small and achievable and and yeah and and you can do it yeah it's yeah, really I, great really great tip. Yeah. I think it's just worth acknowledging as well that you know during the various lockdowns we've had in the last kind of year and a bit just has been really difficult um and lots of people kind of have lost work through it and I know um I'm a teacher so um during term time I don't really have time to think I just do and I get on with it but that kind of works for me and sometimes when it gets to the holidays I suddenly have all this time to think and I have a complete loss of routine and structure and I find myself sometimes going over all sorts of things that I haven't thought for ages that's really unhelpful so I think for anyone the kind of loss of structure and you know some people might have had their sort of a weekly choir session or weekly art session or you know things in the calendar that have been completely disrupted that have you know helped keep us ticking over um so I think um yeah it's I think it was Tilly who um was talking about struggling but it, it that's perfectly natural I think for you know without that kind of structure and routine and work um you know our minds can go down really unhelpful avenues and it's just sort of remembering that um you know thoughts are thoughts and and they're not real um and it's like James said sort of getting out of yourself and physically moving or um yeah kind of tr trying to just sort of implement some kind of sort of routine where even if you're not expecting to enjoy something you do it just to kind of get out of your own head yeah and there's a sorry to jump in there but there's one phrase that I heard a few years ago that I repeat to myself all the time which is I can see my thoughts not be my thoughts and it's that kind of <laughs> mindful idea of there is you know the physical you and then there is the conscious you which is running away with thoughts all the time and then there's a third non-judgmental part of you that's able to observe all of that cognition and the um, meditative idea of watching the cars on the motorway like you can see them but you can watch them pass yeah. by and that kind of stuff that meditative focus can really come through hobbies and positive activities and you know it seems kind of simplistic but if you're feeling bad and something makes you feel good and can distract you from the fact that you feel bad like why not fully engage with it absolutely i i, I know people in the chat are talking about volunteering and and and, and and that was a that was a big part for me with volunteering and allotment and doing or any kind of volunteering I think anything because you, the, the, you know that this is also about distraction as well and getting away from our depression as much as expressing our depression mm -hmm. so you know it's absolutely valid to go and do something because it distracts from the thoughts that you're having you know that's that's good you know that is a absolutely valid way to do that yeah. um so you know if Oh, when I was younger and really struggled with my mental health, I volunteered at an Oxford Saturday. So it was kind of kind of me as a kind of you know fifteen year old boy, and then and then lots of other volunteers, and I was just sorting through clothes. Um, but it was it was fantastic. But also there is something really important I think about you know giving to other people and helping other people actually really helps our mental health. It, it genuinely genuinely does. But it also can give us a break from our thoughts. You know um and that that is really important you know so distract don't underestimate the importance of distraction with activities you know that you know if you're paddle boarding or you're juggling or whatever you might be doing and it's giving you a break from your thoughts then fantastic go go you know do more of that that's, that's really important it's not about denying depression it's not about that's all about managing it's all about managing day to day and that's really important yeah, I think depression as well. I often find that my critical voice doesn't really sound like me. It'll sound like somebody else or it'll sound like an like a stranger, but it's always an external judging voice. And I find that when I am really giving myself a very hard time, it's because I'm gauging myself by standards that aren't necessarily my own. And sometimes I have to kind of even take a step back and give myself permission to do something that I maybe perceive as a little bit silly, like I was playing with polymer clay the other day and I felt kind of silly for playing with clay. But I was like, you know what? No, I get to say what's 
a fun, you know, important activity for me. And I think that is really important as well, just to give yourself the permission to do the thing that makes you feel good and to reject that critical depressive voice that says, well, that's not a useful way to spend your time. That's not X, Y, and Z. Like this is your life and you're allowed to live it exactly how you want and do exactly the activities that you want. And yeah, if there are things that make you feel good by all means do them, yeah. Absolutely, I, you, know, you know, depression, uh, depression will never have your best interests at heart ever, you know? Yeah. So you have, to, you have to go against, you know, what it's saying. So you have to not listen to it and do the opposite, which takes some practice. So I, I was once I I bought a shrub for the garden and I and it took me it took me the whole day to plant it because depression was telling me that I was incapable and I was disgusting and I couldn't do any of those things. So but actually it got to seven o'clock in the evening and I managed to plant the plant despite depression telling me the plant won't grow you're an idiot you're an idiot you're an idiot you're an idiot and it took and it took me the whole day. Um, but depression will not look after you. You know, you need to look after you. And and what Orna's talking about, that voice of depression is really important to distinguish between what the, the voice of depression is telling you and to try and find, you know, your own voice, which is down there. It is down there. It's just been smothered by depression. So it will tell you that if you go to choir, that people will make fun of you, you know, or if you draw a piece of art, that it's going to be rubbish. You know, it will tell you that. Um, but you have to do the opposite of what it's telling you because it doesn't have your best interest at heart ever. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for um, this wonderful panel. Um, I could have listened all day, uh, but unfortunately, we have to bring it to a close. I have um, we, we have another event starting at two o'clock. Hopefully, the audience can can join that too. But thank you so much, Darren. Thank you so much. I've posted a link for the book in the chat um, if you haven't bought a copy just yet. But thank you again, Georgina. Orna and James for a wonderful discussion and thank you audience too for joining in.